Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Assembly of First Nations Special Chiefs Assembly wrapped up today in Ottawa. After a day and a half of voting, a new national chief was finally announced. Here's Annette Francis with the details. They entered the room together in a show of unity, Cindy Woodhouse and David Pratt. After handshakes and hugs from chiefs and supporters, and after six rounds of ballots and hours of deliberations, Pratt made his way to the stage to announce he would concede. But I knew that it wasn't doing our convention any good to prolong, prolong it. When we're facing a housing crisis, when we're facing a suicide opioid crystal meth epidemic in this country. When the jails continue to be filled with our people from one end of this country to the other. Pratt told the chiefs in assembly, we leave here united. And with that, he introduced the new national chief. Our next national chief, Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak. It wasn't an easy ride to the top. Woodhouse held on to the lead from the first ballot, but never made the 60% threshold to win outright. Following the fourth ballot, there was a tense moment when Woodhouse confronted Pratt. Yep, we get that. I still work for them. It just, you said you would concede. But after two days of voting, she made the pledge. I solemnly promise and sincerely pledge to fulfill these duties as they are outlined in our charter to the best of my abilities. Woodhouse told media there's a lot of work to do. A priority is getting to work on the critical issues like housing, infrastructure, homelessness, and access to affordable homes. She's prepared to work with all parties and levels of government. We need solutions and we need to work together and to make sure that especially First Nations on reserves are not overlooked when we're having these national conversations in this country. As one of the lead negotiators for the First Nations child welfare compensation deal with the federal government, Woodhouse says families are a priority. We need to push to bring our families home together again to make sure that we're giving families the supports that they need on everything that they need. If you're giving a foster family all this support, why don't we give our First Nations those supports to make sure that, that, um, you know, that they have strong and healthy families once again. Woodhouse also promised to bring unity within the Assembly of First Nations. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. For more on the election of a new national chief of the Assembly of First Nations, we're joined now by our weekly Truth in Politics panel. Carrie Benjo is the editor of Eagle Feather News, and Negan Sinclair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Kerry Negan, thanks for being here. Kerry, let's start with you. Uh, your thoughts on the election of Cindy Woodhouse as the next National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. I was somewhat surprised, but at the same time, I met in the, the camp where nothing really throws me anymore. I know that she was vying really hard for the position, and um, I guess her work paid off. Neon, your thoughts on National Chief Cindy Woodhouse? Uh, it's back to the future for the AFN. Uh, Cindy Woodhouse is well known as being uh, one of Perry Bellegarde's closest advisors and supporters. Uh, and so certainly turning back the clock to look to the time of Perry Bellegarde, where the organization had a very close relationship with the Liberal Party. Uh, Cindy Woodhouse is a longtime uh, Liberal supporter, uh, involved in the Indig Indigenous Peoples Commission for the Liberal Party. Uh, so it's absolutely uh, an attempt to try to bring the AFN to a closer relationship with the Liberals. But on top of that, I also think that Cindy Woodhouse is a regional leader. Um, they probably had to choose somebody in-house uh, to deal with the Accra and strife that has dealt with and and certainly Cindy Woodhouse was involved with the removal of former National Chief Rosanne Archibald so uh, certainly I think there'll be a lot more voices in the room that agree with each other. Carrie, six ballots uh, somewhat evenly split on the votes there for a while uh, took a concession to end this one. Uh, David Pratt uh, there this morning uh, has pledged his 110 percent support behind uh, National Chief Woodhouse but do you still think there is uh, maybe some divide among chiefs in assembly? I think so. Just the fact that it, it went down to a six, potential sixth ballot means that there wasn't um, a unified front. Unified front. Um, I think that um, 
you know, going into the future, there's still going to be that um, clashing. I think um, I was really hoping that this election would bring out a lot more support, a lot more people interested, a lot more people invested in the outcome. And um, we've seen a, um, quite the battle between the, the two, the Chief Pratt and um, Cindy Woodhouse, our new national chief. And um, I'm really interested in watching what's going to transpire. As Nigon said, she has the insights into AFN. Maybe she will be able to, you know, work faster and get things done. I'm, I'm not sure yet. And Nigon, this term of the national chief has also been extended. So the next vote for a national chief won't happen now until July 2027. No doubt we'll have a federal election in there uh, or two. Uh, how do you see things playing out? Uh, I don't think it's a great look for the organization uh, voting in one of their own who's already a regional chief who had a hand in extending, changing that uh, rule. And then, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a bad look. Uh, it's if you had a hand in changing the rule and then therefore then become national chief, it's not a great look for the organization. But uh, getting back to the issue on the strife. Uh, within the organization, Sheila North, who came uh, second in the 2018 national chief election, was very, very well supported among chiefs this time, uh, made a very interesting concession speech uh, where she referred to violence amongst women and then supported David Pratt. So you would have thought, oh, well, if she's trying to talk about supporting other women, she would have supported Cindy Woodhouse, but then she supported David Pratt. Uh, that, I think, is interesting. I think it suggests that there is a lot of anger that coming from Roseanne Archer about Sheila North also talked about how we shouldn't have ended her term early, uh, which resulted in this extension. Uh, there is a lot of healing that needs to take place at the if. And the question is, is are chiefs willing to wait that long? We only saw about two thirds of the amount of chiefs uh, participate in this national chief election, which tells you that there are 200 or so chiefs that just have no interest in the organization as a whole. Uh, will they come back because of this new national chief? Time will tell. Kerry, Nigon, uh, early days. It's going to be interesting to see how things play out. Appreciate you taking some time for us this week. Yeah, you got Well, we'd like to hear what you think about the election of a new national chief or anything else you want to reach out about. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, including plenty of AFN coverage, go to APTN News. You can also find us online on social media sites including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. On Friday, a Yukon Supreme Court judge will either accept or reject a proposed plea over the 2019 killing of a First Nations woman. Our reporter Sarah Connors gives us the details. The man who pleaded guilty to the 2019 killing of Mary Ann Oley could be handed a nine and a half year sentence on Friday. The sentence was reached in a joint submission by the Crown and Defense and presented to Yukon Supreme Court Judge David Gates during a sentencing hearing earlier this week. 59-year-old Oli, a Casca woman from Ross River, Yukon, was last seen alive in the community on July 31st, 2019. She was found the next day not breathing at the home of Philip Atkinson. While her death was not originally considered suspicious, Oli's autopsy showed signs of injuries and physical trauma. 66-year-old Atkinson, a Casca man also from Ross River, was initially charged with first-degree murder in September 2020, but pleaded guilty to manslaughter back in October. Victim impact statements read to the court described Oli as a kind, gentle, and caring woman who loved her community. Many described how Oli's disturbing manner of death, as well as the time it took to arrest Atkinson, had traumatized community members. The proposed sentence will include a credit of time served in pretrial custody, totaling approximately 4.8 years. If accepted, it will be one of the highest manslaughter sentences in the territory. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. Time for a quick break. Still to come, the long wait to announce the winner in another election has also come to an end. Details coming up.
Welcome back. The wait is over. After three hours of questioning from members of the Legislative Assembly, the Premier for the Northwest Territories has been elected. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs brings us that story. It's a big day in politics north of 60. Members of the Legislative Assembly are in Yellowknife selecting the Northwest Territories' next Premier, Speaker and Cabinet. At the last minute, MLA for Nahunde, Shane Thompson, withdrew his candidacy for Premier, opting instead as the only candidate to put his name forward as Speaker. Thompson says even though he won't be raising issues directly as often, he can get his constituency heard. That's exactly what your role is. Being the Speaker is an honour, it's a traditional it's role, but you're MLA and you need to represent that and you need to respect that your constituents are going to be working. Uh, I mean, I have 17 issues ready to go. I'm just waiting to see who the new ministers are and then I will be working with them on that. So, The three candidates running for premiership include MLA for Range Lake and Yellowknife, Kieran Tetstart, MLA for Yellowknife South, Carolyn Wozniak, and MLA for Hay River North, RJ Simpson. Past Premier Carolyn Cochran is also in attendance with this advice for the new Premier-elect. The most effective leader, in my opinion, is those that will take the opinions from all around, especially on tough decisions, and try to find a solution that will work, uh, that will be acceptable for all members instead of just, like, it has to be my way. And never leave the table. You will have problems as the Premier. There will be relationships that break up. Uh, people will be angry with you for a day or two, but never leave the table. After hours of questions, all 19 MLAs are voting by secret ballot. Thank you, members. Your premier is Mr. R.J. Simpson. Still a bit of shock, but I'm excited. I think we have a really good crew. And, um, you know, the, we made a lot of progress in the last government in uh, working with Indigenous governments, and I think that really is the future of the territory, building those relationships so that we can really build up the territory and the regions. R.J. Simpson is Métis from the small South Slave community of Hay River. He says he plans to start work right away. We got to uh, be more willing to go to Ottawa with Indigenous government shoulder to shoulder. So I think that's, um, you know, that's a way to really bring a lot of money and, and resources into the territory. And there's been a lot of desire from the Indigenous governments to do that as well. So you know, we're moving into a new era of partnerships and it's exciting. It's also the first time since 2011 that the Premier has been elected from outside of Yellowknife. Simpson, who held the Education, Employment and Culture portfolio, along with the Justice portfolio, says he's ready for the challenge. Over the past eight years, I've uh, really learned the value of working with people, and that's the only way to get things done in our consensus government system and in the territory where we have multiple governments um, all across the territory with different capacities. And so working together, collaboration is going to be the hallmark of it. We're no longer in an era where the GNWT thinks it's the boss and is doing everything. We have to work together. This afternoon, MLAs will vote on cabinet ministers two from the Northern Districts, two from the Southern Districts, and two from Yellowknife. The Premier will then hand out portfolios at a later date. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. Cree Métis actress Tantu Cardinal has been inducted into Canada's Walk of Fame in the Arts and Entertainment category, which recognizes individuals who have contributed significantly to the industry. Cardinal is known for bringing Indigenous representation to the movie industry. Her nearly 50-year career includes over 120 roles in various film, TV and theatre productions, including Dances with Wolves, North of 60 and most recently a role in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. She's also a member of the Order of Canada for her contributions of Indigenous performing arts. Congrats to her. Well, staying with the arts, the Winnipeg Aboriginal Film Festival is underway for its 22nd year. This year's events include Indigenous productions from across the world and has a record number of Inuit films. Tamara Pimentel has more. This year's Winnipeg Aboriginal Film Fest features 40 films from around the globe, with an Australian production kicking off the week-long event. The New Boy is a story of an orphan who is brought into a Christian monastery where he begins to question his faith and heritage. 
a common story that needs to be told, according to the festival's program director, Jim Compton. I, I think um, it's important to um, showcase all of our films because um, um, we, um, we all have a story to tell and uh, the, the stories are similar uh, and we need to um, get those stories out there so that we can reconcile with, um, with um, the colonial governments that, that put us where we are. This is the festival's 22nd year. From blockbusters like Killers of the Flower Moon to shorts and comedies like Hey Victor, Indigenous stories are shown on the big screen at Winnipeg's Scotiabank Theatre and other venues across the city. And this year marks a record year for Inuit films with six entries. There is a renaissance going on right now in the world of Indigenous filmmaking. For the first time in, you know, many, many years, well, for the first time ever, if you turn on the TV or you, you go online, you can see Indigenous actors in not only on, in TV shows, but in movies, in, in films, and probably like a record, a record number of, of, of us being reflected back on the screens. And also, it's really decolonization of film because we are in charge of telling our own stories finally, which is what we've been all about for 22 years. Colleen Rajat is the executive director and a filmmaker. Her short comedy, Pickerel Sandwich, will be featured as well. It's part of a web series called Amanda's Choice. Amanda's Choice is about um, 60 scoop survivors who are career women in Winnipeg, and it's about their search for uh, love and, and happiness. And it's kind of like the way I describe it, it's kind of like a native sex in the city. The Winnipeg Aboriginal Film Festival will be on until December 10. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Some great looking films there. Well, as you might imagine, tonight's episode of Nation to Nation will focus heavily on this week's AFN Special Assembly. We've got a preview for you after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. James Moore is like a drifter that was born to walk alone, as he sent in this photo as he walks down the only road he's ever known. Thanks, James, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, for that. To be our next photo of the day, send your pictures to share at aptn.ca. Uh, let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, zero with snow in Halifax, sunny, and minus three in Fredericton. Minus 12 for Kujuak, snow and three below in Nain. Minus six with snow in Montreal, one below with snow in Val d'Or. Five above in Sault Ste. Marie, plus three for North Bay. Five in Thunder Bay, plus two with flurries in Sioux Lookout. Minus two in snow in God's Lake, five below with flurries in Norway House. Plus one and snow in Winnipeg, minus five in Dauphin. Minus one for Regina, Minus two in Saskatoon. Sunny and minus four in Meadow Lake. Eight below in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, minus six with snow in Fort Chippewan. Minus five in Fort McMurray. Three below and cloudy in Edmonton. Snow and minus two in Lethbridge. Plus six for Vancouver. Zero in Kamloops. Minus four with snow in Prince George. Minus five in Smithers. 18 below in Old Crow, snow and minus 5 in Whitehorse. Flurries and 7 below in Yellowknife, minus 13 in Norman Wells, minus 19 in Saks Harbor, 14 below in Politak. Minus 16 for Chesterfield, Whale Cove and Arviet, minus 23 in Resolute, 9 below with snow in Igloo This past spring, 30-year-old Frank Grubin vanished without a trace from the small town of Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. Tomorrow night on APTN Investigates, reporter Carly Schogner looks into his story and examines ongoing concerns over how the territory handles missing persons cases. Here's a preview. Mr. Speaker, today with the permission of Frank Rubin's mother, Laura, I'd like to speak to everybody here. 
and throughout the Northwest Territories and beyond to tell you about Frank, who has been in Fort Smith attending college and was last seen on May 6, 2023. But I don't know how I can deal with this anymore. I don't know how to control it. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to bring awareness of who Frank is, make a face, and turn him into a person for the rest of the territory and the rest of the world. This is my friend, my good friend. He's missing, and I, I don't want to accept that. Frank is an Indigenous man of the LGBTQ community. And when I heard of the statement released by the RCMP yesterday of no evidence of foul play, it shook me to my core. Right now, Frank, to us, has just vanished. Mr. Speaker, if there is no foul play, then where is he? He wouldn't just disappear. Something has happened to him, and somebody knows something. Almost five months has passed. Mr. Speaker, where's Frank? I'm going to ask you again, where's Frank Rubin? Where is this case now with the RCMP and what are they doing next to try to bring Frank home to his mother? As I stated, it still is an open investigation. If there's new information that comes to light, then the RCMP can use that and take further steps. So I reiterate the members' comments. If you know something, please come forward. You can watch the rest of APTN Investigates, the disappearance of Frank Grubin tomorrow night, right here, immediately following the APTN National News. Over to our Ottawa studio now, where Fraser Needham is standing by with a look at what will be, uh, no doubt, a busy episode of Nation to Nation. Coming up after the news on Nation to Nation, it was a marathon of voting at the AFN Assembly in Ottawa this week, but in the end, Cindy Woodhouse has been elected as the new National Chief of the AFN. We also talked to two veterans of First Nations politics about their views on what the future direction of the AFN should be. We're joined by Chief Wally Burns of the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan to get his views on First Nations policing. Stay tuned for Nation to Nation. Sorry, Fraser's still over there on the floor of the Shaw Centre where he probably had to sleep last night. Looks good though, excited to see the discussion with uh, Chief Copanes and Kara. You can watch it all right here in less than two minutes time. That is all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Thursday. You can find much more over on our website, ap10news.ca. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.